in geological terms, Tbilisi and the environs are the seabed, which was formed in the tertiary period of the Kainozoic era. There are layers of the Cretaceous period underneath. Fishes and mollusks used to live here, while billions of biochemical processes churned, exactly the same ones that penetrate the living cells of the urban dwellers of today. Maybe because of this biodiversity, Tbilisi throughout its history has been a very diverse city. Like various sea creatures, species of sea creatures, various ethnic, religious, cultural, linguistic groups coexisted here, mingling, but also keeping their identity. This diversity was tolerated by the city. Moreover, the city encouraged this diversity. Georgians, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Russians, Jewish, Azidis, Germans, Poles, Arabs, for some four centuries, used to coexist here without any problem or conflict. There was a saying, popular saying in the city, you should be a good man, a decent manly man, and no matter where you utter your prayers. Yes, Tbilisi was the sea, but it was a wine dark sea, because wine has been and it still is a ubiquitous substance in this city. A juice of very special kind, like the blood that flows in the veins of the dwellers of the city today. And if you ask me, the wine talk emerged as one of the literary genres of this city, because where there is wine, there is wine talk. Passionate, emotional, humorous, self-ironic. It would take poetic forms sometimes, and sometimes serious poets would also write this kind of, this kind of texts. Let me suggest one tiny example, a short one, almost like Japanese haiku, written by brilliant Georgian romanticist poet Nikolaos Baratashvili in the early 19th century. Excuse my bad translation, but I'll suggest it still. The original goes as follows. Amavseb Gwinit, Agavseb Lachinit, Shesri, Kam. So in English it is like this, uh, if you fill me up with wine, I will fill you up with joy. So let us drink and enjoy. Well, Tbilisi loved poetry. Tbilisi recited poetry. Tbilisi read poetry. Some of this poetry was written by Georgian kings, late medieval Georgian kings, who were not bad poets, by the way. At least they were better poets than they were politicians. What comprised the average Tbilisi library in that period? It was small, of course. Uh, it was The Night in the Panther Skin by Shotaru Stavelli, of course, Georgian national epic. But it was also Georgian translations and adaptations of Mid-Eastern romances, tales, love poems. Big literature comes to this city in uh, early 20th century, when the modernism came to Tbilisi. That's uh, late 1910s, early 1920s. Tbilisi becomes a very vibrant modernist city, an international modernist city, because many modernist artists and authors would come to Tbilisi, uh, would migrate from collapsing Russian Empire and uh, be based here and the city's cafes and restaurants were full of symbolists and Cuba futurists clashing, announcing their manifestos. There were discussions, there were performances, very vibrant modernist life. However, if you ask me, the best texts and novels written about this city emerged when postmodernism comes to Tbilisi. Uh, the generation of post-Soviet period of 19 uh, 90s and uh, uh, 2000s. They tried to deconstruct 
they try to reread this the the spirit of the city they try to rejuvenate it they try to break some cliches about this city and of course urbanize georgian literary language the language of georgian novel of that time now we are in the very heart of the heart of the city that's the bath area the famous bath area with naturally hot uh, subterranean sulfur water the place where the city was born as the legend tells when the king was hunting and when he discovered this hot waters hot springs he decreed the city here and today this city still inspires many authors and many artists it still remains a big source of inspiration it still is a sea in these terms, a wine dark sea. We are in Gori now. Uh, this is a small town in East Georgia, quite close to Tbilisi. Uh, a few years ago it was very hard for me to imagine that I would feel so connected to this town one day because of the events which took place here a few years ago. And right now we are standing in front of the house which was bombed by Russians uh, exactly 12 years ago, like this one. And I guess the whole world saw the videos and photos from this place and exactly of these buildings which are behind us right now. When I look back and start thinking about the Russia-Georgia war of 2008, I realized that this became the war of our generation because uh, this is the war where our friends, our classmates were taken. And of course, I'm not surprised that these events um, had a huge influence on Georgian literature as well, in particular on the texts of young Georgian authors. And very important that so many really interesting texts were created based on these real um, events. This includes prose, poetry, also documentary prose. And I think that both of us are among the people who were influenced by the war of 2008. And I think it's very important because all these books, it's like part of the history. It's like something what will, uh, what next generation will have, like people who don't know about what is happening, they can just uh, look in the, just read books, look at the photos and to understand what was happening in their country. Of course, I, uh, I mean, Georgian literature has always been a mirror of the real life of this country and its history so somehow I'm very glad that our generation also continues this past and Georgian literature stays very close to Georgian people. Maybe we can, we can say a couple of words about our book. Actually this is the topic which is very important for both of us because um, uh, I'm involved for example, in women's rights activism for many years already. And this is a kind of a part of my daily life, actually, to work with women, to listen to them, to know their stories. Uh, and uh, maybe this is the reason why this book became so personal for both of us. I was so lucky that that you came to me with this idea and we I was started very lucky to work with you as well. <laughs> and we started um, searching for these women who had incredible stories and we actually included around 60 women in our uh, our book and uh, in my opinion all of them deserves the the novel of their own because all of them are so unique and uh, all of them had gone through so many things uh, and their war is not over yet actually uh, because of the creeping occupation 
because of the sorrow they have inside them because of losing their loved ones, their husbands, their children, and maybe because of the hope they have as well. Hope of returning to their houses, to their villages. I mean, sometimes I think that when we're talking about occupation, it's not only about the land, uh, but also somehow our hopes and dreams are also occupied together with our lands. So what I really, really want for the heroes of our book is to uh, fulfill and free their hopes and dreams. Here we are at the Writer's House of Georgia, the house that was built by the most prominent Georgian entrepreneur and the patron of arts and sciences, David Sarajishvili. Since the very first day of its opening in 1905, the house has turned into a salon, a sort of a cultural hub for the Georgian writers, uh, musicians and scientists. But uh, in Soviet times, the house has undergone a turbulent history. It has been, um, for decades, the residency of the Writers' Union, so the house remembers the harsh years of the Red Terror uh, and the bitterness of censorship. But today, it's an open space, a public institution hosting the International Festival of Literature and utterly every single individual who creates and translates literature in Georgia. There are not so many of us Georgians who speak, write and read the language. And yes, we do have our own alphabet and our own language and no, it's not Russian, it's very different. Uh, we have the long literary tradition that goes back to the 5th century, the earliest text, earliest surviving text we still read nowadays date back to the 5th century. So these are the Christian uh, writings and then we have the Middle Ages, the big tradition of medieval uh, epic writing. And then in the 19th century, the Georgian language and literature uh, uh, was yet again used as the powerful weapon in the fight of Georgians against the Russian imperialism, because uh, we used to be a part of this big Russian empire. And thanks to those uh, late 19th century writers, uh, the language and the literature have survived. And thanks to those guys and girls back then in 19th century, we, contemporary Georgians, the younger generation of authors, are still able to write in this beautiful ancient language and pave our ways uh, to a bigger audiences, to a bigger nations. But it's not all about past. Let's have a look what is happening nowadays in Georgian literature. Here you can see just a few titles, Georgian titles translated into German, French, English, Italian, Turkish, Albanian and many other languages. The thing is that in 2018 Georgia was the guest of honor country at Frankfurt Book Fair and this was a key change and a breakthrough for Georgian publishing and the literature. Georgian publishers uh, rapidly seized the opportunity to present the contemporary Georgian literature to the world with the diverse publishing program led by Georgian Publishers and Booksellers Association. And we are happy that this process has uh, got a reverberation, so to say, and is still going on. So many other uh, publishers from different countries got interested in Georgian literature and start to publish, translate and publish Georgian titles. So the Writer's House is trying to support this process, support the translations and thus mark ourselves on the literary map of the world. Hello. Here we are in Caucasus, on the edge of East and Central Caucasus. We are in Kazbegi region, in the north slopes of Caucasus Mountains, in one of the most beautiful places 
in Georgia, which itself is quite beautiful and diverse country. And uh, here below us is uh, Georgian, so-called Georgian military highway. Uh, this name was given by uh, uh, to this highway by Russians, who actually built the road to conquer the Caucasus. It was the uh, main road to Transcaucasia. So Russians came to this country and this region in the very beginning of 19th century. This road made a lot of troubles to local population, to, to free Highlanders who never had lords before, and uh, first uh, rebellion against Russian Empire started because this highway, because locals were ordered to work on building of this and uh, to clean it in the winter and they disliked it very much. And also this road is very important not only because of invasion and because of many famous people and writers and uh, militaries uh, and not only Russians came and discovered Georgia this way, but it was also the road uh, which um, our uh, young people mostly uh, they were son of nobles uh, took to uh, moscow and uh, to st petersburg and got uh, education there uh, so uh, under russia they got access to european education which was possible in the big cities of russia and this golden generation of uh, georgian politicians and writers they were called Derek drinkers, because Derek is river. We are on the uh, valley of the Derek River right now. And Derek dr drinkers came back and they start to fight for independence and they became uh, fam very famous people and best people we ever had. And one of them, Alexander Kasbergi, was just from this region. And uh, we can say that maybe today some of his stories, uh, they... Um, are a bit naive, a bit simple, but he is ancestor of contemporary uh, Georgian novel. And this man, he lived here and he described, uh, and his, uh, his stories is uh, also a treasure, it's a ethnographic, ethnographic material, but also he is a very big storyteller of the uh, troubles of local people under Russian Empire and uh, uh, the uh, re rebellions and uh, tragic story and the uh, stories full of honor. His uh, heroes of his story are local poor Highlanders who have nothing, uh, inst only their honor and they are fighting sometimes alone against huge empire. And the local uh, people, uh, we call them Moheve, and also or in general people of Caucasus, uh, Georgian mountain people, they, they themselves, uh, they love to read books. Not all the books I believe, but uh, they are good readers. And uh, they, uh, most, of the, uh, most of all, they, like, uh, they always like some romantic novels, romantic poems, and not only Georgians. I was very much surprised as a young man, then I discovered that in many local houses, uh, they have uh, poems of uh, Scottish poet uh, Robert Barnes and by heart they know a lot of his poem and later i uh, understood why because robert Barnes is poet of mountains and his spirit of his poet and he was translated in georgian and uh, they um, find spirit of his poem very familiar so many writers and not only russian uh, famous writers like uh, uh, Alexander Pushkin and Lermontov and Lertost, of course they came to Caucasus on this road, but also famous writers like uh, Knut Hamsun. He came from Russia and discovered Georgia. He came through this narrow valley, which we call Dariali Valley, and he wrote a really wonderful uh, book. Uh, of, uh, the name of book is uh, In the Miracle Country, and he really describes uh, Georgia and whole Ca Caucasus like a miracle land, land of fairy tale, and he was here like many others. Mm -hmm.